Mother, how long have we been traveling? Approximately 24 days. Ash, any suggestions from you or Mother? No, we're still collecting. I've got access to Mother now, and I'll get my own answers. Thank you. You are listening to Yutani, the podcast for all things alien, AI, robotics, sci-fi, and technology. Hi everybody, this is Clara, but you can call me Mother, and welcome to our really super special exclusive coverage of the Alien Covenant Ridley Grams. But before I get started, I want to introduce my co-host today, Connor Coulson. <laughs> Ta-da! <Hello. laughs> All right. Um, now, it's, it's pretty exciting. Someone has sent me a copy of the alien covenant ridley grouse actually i should say prometheus 2 and this has not been seen by anyone on the internet at all um i've had some people who've worked on the production verify these for me and they are real so this is your uh well and truly first look at um the ridley grams and i'm gonna encourage uh outlets to get in touch with us to get a copy um because we're not going to be posting them to the blog uh, we're going to talk about them and view them here and i can show you on the video uh, but if you want to be able to repost this you're going to have to get in touch with us uh, because this is super special <laughs> but uh yeah so firstly i'd like to uh say to connor wow what, what we've come a long way from doing a reaction uh podcast on the um the the prologue for paradise yes. uh, alien paradise we've gone from scripts to images one day we might even review motion pictures maybe <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't that be great to get like uh cut out um stuff from the film because i know they filmed at least two weeks worth or maybe two days worth of um stuff with elizabeth shaw or uh, b-roll footage and stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Um, but um, yeah, the so the Ridley Grams, you can see the, I think it's the Prometheus ones, maybe, Covenant ones, but definitely in Prometheus and the special features, you get some of his illustrations, and in some of the books, you get some of them, but not in order, it's just random ones to, to give you an idea of, of what a Ridley Gram looks like. Mm. But for those who aren't aware, uh, Ridley Scott, he actually began as a as an art student. I think a lot of creative types do start out doing an art course because they don't know what they're actually good at yet. I, I definitely did, and then I ended up in tailoring costume making. That's very different. But yeah, I think anyone who is creative, you do want to go, oh, can I paint? Can I sculpt? Can I draw? So on and so forth. And... I've not actually seen any art that Ridley's done that's more finalized, but I've definitely seen these Ridley grams around. So they're his storyboards, and they're good stuff, though. They they really do convey what he he's envisioning in terms of framing and stuff like that. Um, I think a lot of people tend to go, oh, well, it, it's the, um, the cinematographer who comes up with, with all of this. And... It's a bit of 50-50, especially with Ridley's films. He definitely has a very specific vision in mind. He's a very he's very much a visual thinker. And you can tell by his approach to all of his films. He's all about telling the story visually and and how that's constructed, how that's conveyed, so on and so forth. Um, to, some might even argue to the detriment of the script and the logic of the plot, but that's neither here nor there. If you want more of that debate, uh, I guess Prometheus by Minute's the place to go. Yeah, absolutely. So, yes, let's let's pimp your podcast for just a second. So where are you up to on Prometheus by Minute? Just did episode 68, so next week is episode 69. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to have guns. to say that. 
all yeah through the whole episode i'm just gonna be after going and this is minute 69 <laughs> like uh, the mature adult i am oh yeah <laughs> it's the great. sex number you have to say uh, there's no minute 420 sadly so oh. good actually god damn 420 minutes <laughs> Maybe for a James Cameron film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> True. Or, or Denis Villeneuve, if he ever... Um, Denis Villeneuve? Yeah, if he ever goes that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's doing Dune, so maybe. Mm, yeah, that should be a very, very long and lucrative podcast, whoever <laughs> takes up that challenge. Um, uh, I might actually, not to tend it too much, <laughs> but I, I keep looking at more movies to do a movies by minute podcast on. So obviously Alien Covenant, that's definitely, that's sorted. Although I haven't decided if it's going to be Covenant by minute or do I call it Alien Covenant by minute? I haven't decided on the specifics of the name yet, but um, the other one, definitely want to do Tron Legacy, that's still available. But then maybe Blade Runner 2049, there's already a Blade Runner minute, but... Uh, yeah, 2049, that's free. Yeah. So oh, wow. I'd love to come on to that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. We better get onto it. Um, yes. So this is page one. I'm going to just show people the page. So this is what we've got. This is before uh, Alien Covenant. So this is not the prologue that we start with David in the room. This is where uh, David is headless and outside of the ship. Or is he bodiless? Bodiless, yeah. <laughs> trying to um, convince Elizabeth Shaw to let him back in, basically. So, yes. And then further down on the page, we have the engineers watching the descent of the juggernaut. So this is because these are Ridley Grams, it's pretty fast. So we're going through quite a lot of the movie initially. So this is when the prologue was still the crossing. And yeah, so this isn't so much if, if you're familiar with storyboards, they're almost like a, a comic book where every single panel is 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 a beat or a moment in the sequence. But these ones are a little bit more like a a plot outline or like the the chapter selections on a DVD. Yeah, that's right. So so in the first panel, um, we've got a vision of the juggernaut in space with David's body uh, and head. So both of him is outside of the ship mm. um it says here uh david exchanges with shaw so that's when david's talking to shaw saying oh you know i'm starting to die blah 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 where where let me in <laughs> <laughs> um, was he tethered somehow or was he just yeah they, floating? She, she she like she was dragging him oh, outside right. the ship kind of it, it kind of reminds me of like in, in back in the day when people had like seafaring ships and someone was misbehaving so they chuck him yeah. in a lifeboat and kind of like tether the lifeboat to the ship kind of like an isolation punishment instead of mm. locking him in the brig he'd be out on a little lone boat kind of have to fare the waves by by themselves so i think that's you know very classic of ridley to do that <laughs> Yeah, a bit of a throwback. I've noticed his handwriting is quite interesting uh, based on his age, because when he was in school, he would definitely have been taught cursive. That would have been the standard. Um, but he absolutely has the all-caps font that everyone working in... Uh, is, oh, God. So if you're doing any sort of... Uh, art sort of stuff or carpent oh carpenters definitely do it just if you've either got a trade or yeah if you're working in movies building things and that sort of stuff everyone seems to have that all caps way of writing <laughs> and i don't know what that is uh my dad had it and he was oh well he did all sorts of things sandblasting drilling all that sort of stuff. and everyone like that has the all caps font don't know what that is yeah um, who knows why? <laughs> but Pops I guess people it's, too, also. Yeah. It's easier to read, I guess. With cursive, it can be a bit of a mixed bag. Yeah. So yeah, it, I wonder what his what, what his decision making behind that was. <laughs> Not sure. Um, in in panel three, we've got the Juggernaut arriving uh, at the Engineers' planet, so they haven't named the planet yet. 
Okay. But he, it does make it clear that this is indeed the engineer's planet, not some other, you yeah. know, branch of the... the some fans have this theory of it. No, they weren't really engineers. They look different. Now nah, it's called um, a smaller budget. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the makeup's not quite the same, but... You can't do Ian White's makeup on everyone. That is really expensive. The Scaleras are very expensive. Oh, my God. I've looked into that before. And also, where are you going to find a heap of seven-foot-tall people? Let's be <laughs> honest. That's another <laughs> issue. Um, but yeah, so it's nice to have that confirmation. Uh, the, the font, the, the, the handwriting is very clear also. So just thought I'd point that out too. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I could accept the theory, I guess I'll go into this in Alien Covenant a minute eventually that, you know, not all engineers look the same, like they're purpose built, if you will, like, uh, or ants and some insects, maybe bees as well, they definitely look different whether they're a drone or um, obviously the queens. Um, what's the other one? Drones and the... Drones. Soldier drones. ones? Uh, I think warriors. Oh, God. I think so, the yeah. The drones and the warriors are the same thing, I think. It's really hard with the xenomorph, like, tree. <laughs> Yeah, because they uh, well, you, very you see it with, with xenomorphs as well, yeah. <laughs> but um, you definitely see that there is purpose behind their physical appearance. So maybe the engineers are a bit the same. So you've got the, the giant warrior looking ones that are they're quite impressive. And then you've got these more I know, domesticated civilian looking ones. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a wolf versus a dog. Yeah, exactly. Um, in, in number four, we've got the, what does it say? Uh, the, the what engineers? Looks like people, engineers. Yeah. People, engineers, they'll be, <laughs> they're just regular people as opposed to, okay. you know. Maybe that's what he meant. He has a, he does have an odd way of wording things sometimes, so. Yeah. People engineers watch the descent of the juggernaut, David Obey. Yeah, maybe he was trying to say, like, the civilians, you just couldn't think of the word. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I noticed in, in number five is it says David opens and drops the payload on the city, and you can see two silhouettes there. So one's obviously David, and, he, and the other one's Shaw. Um, and of, obviously, because we've read the prologue, and I urge you to stop watching this stream or this recording if you haven't yet because spoiler alert <laughs> Shaw is alive <laughs> yes. and then she's not <laughs> yes um we had opinions about that so if you want to hear that that's <laughs> that's in that podcast yes um but uh through panel six you can see uh the destruction and what it says italian animator artist work Aliz alessandra bavari so people if you don't know alessandra bavari um was in uh, his art inspired the pathogen drop and i can also link to that as well and it's really interesting the shapes that came through the um the dna shapes of the pathogen coming out of the ship all of that sort of stuff was predetermined by this artist so it's pretty pretty neat yeah, uh, I quickly Googled him before we recorded this, and I can definitely see the influence there. And I love how every single one of these movies by Ridley Scott is influenced, alien films, I should specify, um, is influenced by an illustrator. Uh, that, that's, he obviously knows that's what made the original alien what it was, is. H.R. Giger, because he didn't come from a cinematic perspective. He had nothing to do with filmmaking. So his visual style was very much its own thing. It came from a very different source. Whereas if you look at a lot of concept artists and stuff, these are all people who love movies. They're all watching the same kind of things. So there's a bit of there's a bit of inbreeding going on. There's a lot of similarities where, say for example, a lot of spaceships look the same. A lot of spacesuits look the same. It's just the the genres become a bit stale and repetitive. But if you look outside of that that pool, you can go into. I mean, it, it's a visual medium. There's 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 no limit to where you could go, especially nowadays with the sort of things we can do with technology. 
So for Prometheus, oh, I can't remember. He's a Russian um, sort of CGI artist that they use for inspiration. I'm blanking on his name now. But he was this guy. He's on DeviantArt. Um, I think that's where they discovered him. And his his style is very Giga-esque, but on a much grander scale. So he's doing things digitally, which means that he can, you know, go in and zoom right on into these tiny details and then, you know, make a, a big image. And it's it's much more detailed than anything he could do, obviously, with an airbrush and by hand. Um, and then here, um, Alessandro Bavari, he is not coming from a movie perspective either. He's doing things that defy physics and reality and stuff. So, honestly, more filmmakers need to take this approach. Let's push those boundaries. Let's do things that haven't been done before. Mm, absolutely. And I really love his stuff. Well, I'll link to the video which inspired the pathogen drop, and you'll be able to see uh, how it influenced that That really striking part of the film which they ended up moving to the center but at, at right now in this um ridley graham's collection it's at the beginning uh, it is a powerful and haunting scene and yet it's very short i think it's only about two minutes if that yeah um recently i had to watch it over and over and over again because i was kind of fun having a, a semi argument with someone <clears throat> andrew Gasca, <laughs> who I will I will name, uh, saying that there were uh, neomorphs popping out of the bodies, but no, it's just more of the pathogen liquid. I believe in the concept art they originally did intend for, the, you know, instant mutations and instantaneous creatures bursting out, but of course that doesn't really make a lot of sense in terms of the established continuity. It does take some time for these creatures to be born although they do make the gestation period even shorter in alien covenant with the backburster of course um and there was something oh um the other visual aesthetic that they're drawing on here of course throughout the entire film is gothic horror and a lot of you know victorian uh, artwork oh 19th century artwork and it shows every once in a while uh, you know because i'm not focusing on alien covenant now I, I'm watching Prometheus, you know, every week. But every once in a while, I'll look in at Alien Covenant just for research or whatever. I'm just blown away by how beautiful it looks. It's just, yeah, it's a smaller movie. It doesn't have as many locations and whatever, but they it's gorgeous. They managed to make it really grand. Like, it's yeah. big. <laughs> it feels, it's, it doesn't feel like a TV show. Not, it doesn't even feel like even on a HBO scale, it, feel, it feels bigger than that. It's properly cinematic. And watching that in a cinema, you, you definitely uh, benefited from that experience. Mm. Even the soundtrack, it really aids to it. Like, uh, I really love the soundtrack that they play oh, when they're going into God. the city. It's just Oh, yes. Uh, Dead Civilization is yeah. my favorite track. And the it's horn just, and mm. everything. It's just, if you've turned Goose it up bumps. really loud at your house, it's like... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, it, it, yeah, that is definitely a soundtrack that, uh, oh God, what's his name? Jed Kurtzel. It's, yeah. he knows how to make something that works for th theater speakers. It, 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 I definitely had a lot of goosebump moments watching Alien Covenant. And before there's even anything on screen, the screen's pitch black, but you have that sort of, the, the bell sound that that ringing sound and you just it's it's so creepy before you see anything of the film the mood is set yeah yeah it's really cool um, it was a religious experience <laughs> <laughs> it was okay now the very controversial panel seven which i will I'll hold up so it says here david flings uh shaw's body from the ship and from what we know is that he snaps her neck just hmm. as she's looking down into the city seeing her creators and starting to cry and being a really touching moment uh david reveals himself to be that mustache twirling bad guy which we come to experience in alien covenant yeah i feel that david 
is a little bit more dignified than that. I, if I had to compare him, I'd say he's close to a Hannibal Lecter. He's not just some thug. I think there's a little bit more sophistication, or at least an air of, of sophistication. He thinks of himself as, as very dignified and, and all of that. Um, and I think later in Covenant, you know, I think it's, what, like 10 years later, they find him on this planet alone. He's become more feral. But there's still some illusion of dignity and of sophistication. So for him to just snap her neck like this, it's... I think it would have been a lot crueler if we saw... It's crueler. It's uncalled for. But I love the idea that, and I've given this a lot of thought, of course, Mm. is, um, what, it's been two years, over two years since the film came out. So I've given it a a fair bit of thought. I like the idea that he offers her perfection, that he offers her elevation, ascendance, that she could become greater than human, that he, he loves her. And so his way of honoring her is by improving her, that he he knows that humans are flawed and and ephemeral and temporary and all of that. So he wants to make her into this perfect organism. I think it would be great in this scene to show, yes, I'm wiping the slate clean and I'm giving you the greatest gift I could ever imagine. You could become greater than anyone of your kind. Uh, which of course this it's, it's very it's very against her personal ethics. It's against her her religion um, to to desecrate the body like that. But I would love it if he did it out of love. That he was like, I am giving you the greatest gift I could ever possibly imagine giving anyone, mm. and she rejects it. And then you, oh, I mean, just a ima- I mean, both of these actors are definitely up to the challenge of just her. That kind of reminds seeing... me of um, I Am Mother. Like, yes, yes. Yeah, that's the, another good example the, of. The robot trying to elevate her, her creators to something more, something better. You know, I could see yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> it's and, so cool. but, the, but the great thing here is. Um, well, you've got Michael Fassbender, so he's got a human face. He can really convey all that nuance. And he's he's an android who definitely feels. So just seeing the utter devastation and betrayal, like he was so convinced this was the right thing to do. And then for her to just sort of give him this perspective, this wake-up call of, no, you're out of your goddamn mind. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she, that would have been better. Give me that version. <laughs> oh, and then it would make sense that he... Take it. <laughs> oh, that's... A... I am such a, a masochist when it comes to Alien, especially Shaw and David. Just mm, give me the tragedy. Give me the pain. I want it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, I think that would also help serve to explain um, how she ended up the way she did with all the illustrations or, and then her, her final body composition um Mm. (laughs) but at the same time i think it the biggest problem is you give away the shock if i think it's much better that is it walter just walks in and sees her body and like oh fuck what happened (laughs) whereas if you get any scene or prologue or whatever where you see what led up to it then you're like oh okay okay i mean it's horrifying still and it's tragic but I know what happened. So yeah. maybe... like, we, we are left questioning what happened to Elizabeth Shaw. Cause like, yeah, we're still talking about it. <laughs> we get David's truth, which is like, yeah. she died in the crash, you know, but yeah. it's not, not what it seems. Yeah. I think it's all. Yeah. I mean, this his character building. There's still room here to explore that and to show a different perspective. Um, so yeah, if they do a third film or whatever it is that they end up doing, it would be nice to have that moment. My uh, heart is still set on like a, a David and Shaw film and showing how she dies and like going back to the engineer city, you know, mm. the isolation. They could totally Honestly, do it. <laughs> I'd be cool with a, a mini series, you know, like, um, like Chernobyl. That was like five episodes and it was just... Oh, so gripping from beginning to end. It, it got to be like a real slow burn, deep dive into the subject. And 
give me something like that with Alien. That would be dope. Mm. And that's like, you know, five, six hours instead of just, you know, two, three hour movie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're on to page two and, and cell number eight. This is aerial view of thousands of engineers as they gather to witness the arrival. And then number nine is C Holocaust Italian animator. And they've abbreviated his name. So obviously they've uh, dropped the path- pathogen. Yes. Uh, and then it says the city and thousands fill. Fall? Flee? Flee? Flee from, from the plague. The plague. Yeah. Yeah. See a. Uh... <laughs> See a glimpse of the city and grounds. Glimpse, yeah. Uh, something. <laughs> Thanks, Ridley it's Scott. Fort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he he started off very clear, and now he, he's almost getting into cursive oh, a bit there. City as as crowds surge. Crowds surge. That makes sense. See a huge statue presiding over the chaos so what we see here is a figure standing in the middle with their hand downwards and that's actually supposed to be a statue Mm. so it's kind of it kind of looks like uh and like one of the leaders of the engineers an official or something but in, in the back you can see they finalized on the design the dome in the background which is the the citadel the engineer um yeah, I'm trying to remember in Covenant there were statues, but I don't think they were all intact, were they? No, there were like four of them s- sitting around the center, which where the juggernauts mm. were supposed to lift out of. Uh, mm. And then there were ones on pedestals. But I really do love the concept art for the engineer's planet. I think that it, it, it shows a lot of their culture and it gives us some glimpses. You know, I, I love the fact that the engineers are so mysterious and it, it always gets my imagination going. If anything, in my podcast, I think I talk about engineers as much or, yeah, I'm probably about as much as I talk about androids, but androids aren't as mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the prologue done. This is end of prologue on the next page. This is page three. I'll just show everyone what the pages look like. So now we're, we've gone to the Covenant and we can see, at least if you've go to, gone to the concept art, you'll be able to see that, that this is when they had the, the cross on the sail. Kind of looks like a, a colony ship heading for the new world. Yeah, it's a bit on the nose. <laughs> yeah, it's very obvious. I like the, the anonymity of it. That came I love the look the of the... Yeah, the look of the Covenant. It's, it's purpose-built... Um, it, it's nothing special, but it's there is a beauty to it, and it is unique. If I saw an image of the Covenant out of context, like, oh, I, I definitely know where that came from. It's not just a random ship to me. Mm. It's kind of like the same as, I think I think it's called The Discovery in 2001, A Space Odyssey. It's very Yeah, that sort of... Um, very striking uh, design. Yeah, it's got the, the, the ring around it, which you don't see a lot. Oh, these sort of... Yeah, not there aren't that many. I think it's in Interstellar. Yeah, which is a complete rip-off of that film. <laughs> which, yeah. <laughs> like we, keep re- we keep remaking 2001 A Space Odyssey. My, my, my housemate said, do you think they'll ever remake something like like a Kubrick movie, like 2001? Like, they haven't stopped remaking it. They just don't call it... <laughs> 2001, I mean, yeah, Prometheus and Interstellar, they're all uh, variations on a theme, which I welcome that, actually, that instead of doing a direct remake, which, I mean, there can be good remakes, Mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, but I think it's nice to go, I have been so inspired by this idea um, and I've been influenced by these specific ideas, but I don't want to just do a beat-for-beat remake. I've got these new things. I've got my own life experiences and ideas that I want to incorporate. Mm. That's how stories evolve. That's how you get to a new place. So I'm I'm all for it. Mm. It's pretty quick. Like number ten sums up the entire interaction that happens on the Covenant. It takes up a fair. I feel like it takes up a fair chunk of the film. But it says open on the spaceship, yeah. meet the crew, see the transmissions. They land on the planet. Boom. 
That's pretty much what it's like when you are writing a skeleton draft for a book or a novel or whatever you want to call it. Um, I've definitely done it too, where I go, okay, so this scene will be about um, establishing character and their relationships and stuff. And it's just like, it takes up one sentence, but when you actually have to get in there and expand on that, it takes a long time Mm -hmm. and it will take up a a fair chunk of a story. Um, It just, it's about when it comes to actually describing it, it's, to say. <laughs> yeah, well, we don't see the, the death of Branson. We don't get introduced to Daniels. There's not the interaction of the crew and the discussion about getting to the planet. So a lot of that stuff is skipped over. But the Yeah, stuff this he is has, the big beats. Yeah, so when he has expanded on it, it says here, um, lander out of control. So obviously, that's the bumpy flight into the planet. Mm. Um, see the black and white Ansel Adams uh so i don't know i didn't google that one did you google that one that rings a bell yeah. I'm look. all right well connor's looking that up i'll read the rest it says uh it recovers so they're talking about the lander and it says lands and bumpy landing so it's kind of like the nostromo landing on lv426 maybe mm. it's a call back to that um, ah he's a he's a photographer and if you look at his stuff it's all, it's all black and white, and it's, it is it is very Covenant. Wow, this is... They got it very close. Um, so Ansel Easton Adams was a landscape photographer and environmentalist known for his black and white images of the American West. Um, mm. So he was born in 1902, died in 1984. <clears throat> wow. And um, I'm wondering... So when it comes to these storyboards... What's the emphasis? You know, I, I've been thinking about this as we've made our way through it. Like, is he trying to um, show the most important story beats? Is he trying to establish the most important um, sets, like physically building these sets? What are the ones we have to focus on and emphasize? Um, set pieces, if you will. I know a lot of mm-hmm. it happens with theater as well, where if you look at how they break down a script, it's not the way an actor would break down a script. It's, okay, we've got about five major sets, and then you sort of draw your storyboard from there. So I'm thinking that's more along the lines of what he's doing here. We will get more specific character beats, but now I think about it, they're actually special effects beats. Mm. Well, it says here, it's, it, yeah. um, land a site as uh, the explorers split into two teams. And it says Aram Lope and team head off. And then he says midges. So I think like this is when we see the moats. We actually yes. see them before the maybe the foot interaction even. Like they're just around. It's... I'm amazed how accurate these storyboards are. Like he really had a very specific idea in mind of, you know, like the lander and the lake and the forest and the scale of the trees compared to the people. He conveys it. The very simple illustration, but he's conveying a lot. Mm. And I, I guess that's that's Ridley Scott. That's how he doubled the budget for Alien um, before mm. it was even produced. So yeah, I think he. I wonder if he does have hyperphantasia, which, uh, if you're unaware, it's where you have this sort of overactive imagination. You're you're very uh, good at visual thinking, and I'm so convinced he must see the film all the way through in his head in in full quality Mm. yeah he definitely is a visual artist Mm -hmm. uh what's that word something uh which one trees just above trees Uh, on number what number 13 oh 13 he's crossed it out deciduous Deciduous? (laughs) Disastrous? <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, D I S G, and then the rest is crossed out. Mm. Yeah, not sure. But it's a C animation. Mm. So they've got like the trees, and they've got the shoal. So it says C animation as well. What's orgic? Angic? Angic. Hmm. Not sure. We'll have to look that up. Okay, I'll do the research. Uh, so it says, uh, Karen and Ledward break off. So, you know, this is the, we're following the same beats of the film, ideally. Uh, 
Trin and Ledward are heading off, and you can see these midges are following Ledward. Uh, no results found for Andrik. Uh, it's an Indian name, it seems like, but um, I, I'm wondering if he's referring to uh, animation they've already got, like yeah, previs maybe. animation. Uh, I'll have to look up the art department and see if they ended up hiring anyone by that name. Uh, it says here in panel 15, so we're on page 4 now, Corinne examines uh, remains in the stream. Yeah, so she actually finds a little fetus thing. Yeah, so it says, uh, I can't even hear, a creature in the stream see... Carlos design. So this is talking about Carlos Fonte, who worked right. on um, the concept art for the film when it was Prometheus 2. Ridley bloody loves his baby head monsters. He's, yeah. He wants like that sort of beluga headed thing. He, well, he loves it. If you look at a lot of H.R. Geiger's work, he's got a lot of baby heads in his work as well. Yeah. So maybe it was intentional to have um, a lot of like callbacks to the original artists from the film at least i know that was the case when the, they came to the design of the covenant they look at like chris foster's work and and stuff like that so yeah uh he he doesn't let a good idea go i really respect him for that he is very much the culmination of of decades of directing and yeah I, I, we've gone back and looked at the initial the, the very first drafts for the first alien movie and there are echoes of prometheus in there mm. so i'm just holding up the the page now and i'm showing you the it's a the, the midges are coming closer so to speak so there's no moat sacks they're just insects that are roaming the planet um so that's the way that ledward gets infected he's waving off the midges i'm wondering smoking. well it's it's midges in quotation marks so i think he he's trying to get ridley is trying to convey how it behaves uh rather than giving it a taxonomical classification hmm. so i have to wonder maybe it is a single-celled organism maybe they're more like sperm you know it's not really alive it, i mean it is but it's not Mm. alive in the sense that we would traditionally think of um it's it's a single celled organism that is a part of something else yeah in page uh seven oh, sorry in uh ridley graham 17 we see it says c midgey in macro and micro animation andrew thomas so there we go we've got another name you want <laughs> do you want to look at that one up yeah so I, i'm guessing these are sort of production notes for, for uh, the employees to sort of take notes from. Yeah. I, I know that uh, it's a very has... common name, it turns out. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, so, my God, yes, we've got uh, a writer, producer. Try Andrew Thomas' means... Alien Covenant, or An yeah. Andrew Thomas' Prometheus 2. Um, so in number 18, we've got the close-up of the ear, and it's a C, Muji, enter his... Uh, number so eighteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see the midget enter his ear. Aperture. Is that aperture? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Um, it says macro and macro of Miji A Thomas C animations the animation. So, I I know that Dominic Halstone came up with the some of the concepts for the look of the moats. Mm. Um, and how they interact. Um, but then yeah, uh, Andrew Thomas did not show up in my quick search, but uh, that's the thing is so many movies, uh, they, they have such a huge cast and crew, but not every one of them ends up getting credited. Mm. Yeah. Or people are brought in in the early development phases, but they're not actually involved in the final production, therefore they don't actually get credit for it. You don't notice this until you look at individual uh, filmmakers credits so um mm. happens to you all the time for whatever reason on instagram you all have like these directors or artists who work on films follow me and i was oh okay well do, do i know your work and if you look at their resume they've done a lot of stuff but their imdb wouldn't reflect it because they just 
the the, the stand-ins or their early um, pre-production mm. people or storyboard artists. Yeah, so it, that means that this industry is even bigger than it already looks. Yeah, and and that's one of the things um, I guess for you, Tani, is that we we try to shine a light on the people who haven't gotten credit for the work that mm-hmm. they've done, no matter how small. Um, and that was uh, part of the reason why we started the creatives series. So, so it's good. I'm going to have to try to look this guy up and see if other people know of him so we can shine a light yeah. on his work. Uh, so in panel number 20, we've got Ledwood and Korean. Obviously, they're in, uh, the, they call it the hospital bay. Uh, and it says much better than sick bay in star trek the next generation that just what is this primary school what <laughs> yeah. sick bay they call serious? it the med bay in um in alien so yeah, yeah and this is through porthole so we're looking at them through the porthole obviously uh faris is on the other end but they they don't mention her they go from mm. the infection straight to uh the hospital bay and it says here, oh no, it does say here. So there's a little picture on the side. I'll just show people. Um, there's a little picture on the side that shows Faris as she's looking through the porthole at what's happening. And they're showing um, Corinne and Ledward and, and the emerging uh, Neomorph. So it says, and it's described as a, see the goblin shark still. So there's, he's, he's, that's. He loves his goblin shark, so he's still using that as an influence too. Yeah, there's um. It says here, Faris through port, portal, porthole, portal backs away. Port, porthole, yeah. Call, call for help. Ledwood's back, splitting, separating skin, and then Stefan Lavolis, uh, who works for NPC, he did the storyboarding, so we've got the storyboards for that as well on the blog. Mm. Uh, Faris backs away, and then we can see the little spikes coming out of the back. It is quite interesting looking through something like this, which is very much for a production team. It's not made for public consumption. So so many things where we're going, oh, who was that for? Or who is this person? Yeah, that's right. Because we've like analyzed this movie to hell, <laughs> we kind of know all of these little, uh, at least not all of these little notes, but some of these little notes that have been mm. made inside this uh, Ridley Graham collection. Uh, it says, Ed- Ledward erupts, Ledward quivering. Uh, I'm quite certain that even after I cover both of these films minute by minute, there's still going to be new things I'm going to discover or things I didn't cover in the podcast. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, which makes for good conversation as well, because if you cover mm. everything, then there's nothing to talk about. That's why you have guests on, uh, so you, <laughs> someone else has more uh, information or experience. Uh, in here, uh, when the Neomorph is emerging, this was when it was emerging kind of like a shark. So the back of the Neomorph's head was supposed to jut out, um, and that's what they, they have well, here, I'm pointing out. Mm. So it looks like a spike, but it's actually the back of the Neomorph's head. Um, so Carlos first generation for babies for Neomorph, it says here in the notes and mm. Stefan Levolis. So that if you've gotten the the Gilk, Gilsey, the good clay print of the backburster, uh, scene. Oh, it's gl- that- g- oh, that's a, that's a horrible, like gl- glickly, like what, how do you gl-clay. say that? Glickly. Um, so that's actually... Uh, Stefan Lavolis' uh, illustrations, they're not Ridley Grands, and those were mm. mass produced and and given out as prizes or as something that you could buy. Uh, so the, we'll also link to that if anyone wants to have a look. It says here, Corinne leaps away and Faris on land a bridge screaming for help. So that's obviously when they've called the Covenant and Tennessee does that really amazing performance sorry Danny McBride that was really yeah good. <laughs> yeah it, I they do say that comedy is that to, to go from comedy to drama is a lot easier than drama to comedy but I'm always blown away when a comedian can give me a performance that is just so real and so moving and I really did feel his devastation uh when he found out that uh that Faris was, was dead. Mm, 
absolutely. Um, now we're on to page six in uh, panel 25. It says, C. Carlos drawing of Neomorph in Lander killing also include NPCs visuals. So like, I think the Neomorph is doing like the eye gouge thing mm. that, that it was supposed to be like the Xenomorph crushing Brett's head in Alien. So it's yeah. a homage to that. Mm. And then the Goblin Shark. <laughs> Again, shark snapping at camera. So they had the, the, this was when the mouth would come out of its maw. And um, it had a different design. It kind of looks a bit more like the Deacon, I guess. Yeah. I feel that uh, while Ridley says that the beast is cooked and there's nothing more to be done with the Xenomorph itself, he does still seem to enjoy the the beastie stuff. So the the backburster sequence, I, I feel there's more passion in it. I, mm. I He really wanted to do that, whereas the... Well, I'll talk about it when I eventually get to it but i find that whole third act is contractually obligated rather than something that came from real passion mm. i i could see it in prometheus like obviously like the hammerpede scene the trilobite extraction all of those things like he hasn't lost his touch he just doesn't want mm. to deal with the xenomorph anymore and when yeah. he says xenomorph and the alien he just means specifically the one that we've been peddled four films you know hard in like he's yeah obviously which got his heart I, somewhere else and there's nothing wrong with what he's doing I, i'm thoroughly enjoying it yeah i totally accept that and it, it makes so much sense and i don't want the xenomorph to just become you know what freddie and jason and all these other uh cinema monsters become where it's just Oh, yeah, I've seen you a million times. You don't really scare me anymore. Um, I mean, the Xenomorph is definitely still terrifying, but it has been overused. There's no denying that. And so taking that theme and then just altering it a little bit. So, okay, now we've got Neomorphs. Now we've got, you know, backbursts. We've got, uh, you know, uh, ones that erupt out of your mouth and all those fun things. Like, yeah, let's take it in a new direction it doesn't have to be the exact same thing over and over and over which those four alien movies it's the same kind of xenomorph over and over again you've yeah. got the alien queen so okay there you built upon the mythology a bit more but after that they're just xenomorphs yeah chest burst chest burst another chest burst how many times can mm. we kill a person doing this god even the predator mixes it up a bit more than the xenomorph does mm, and, and i feel like there's less films for predator as well so yeah so it shows here um c forest and this is torchlight animation on trees luminous bark so this is where carlos fuente's concept art comes in where they had this sort of pandora looking like planet yeah, glowing, that wouldn't have worked. Glowing plants and stuff like that. Well, that would have been when the budget was bigger. I I think that would have been cool, but at the same time, because James it's Cameron so has not, already done it. Yeah, but it's so not alien. I Alien should not have many vivid colors or anything typically beautiful. I think if you, you make it look more like, I don't know, Poison Ivy's garden or, or Pandora you were pushing it into different mm. genres, whereas I think Alien, Alien has should a, be quite... It's down to earth and has a grotesque beauty. Yeah, like even Prometheus, which is much more glossy and pretty, the planet itself, like the ship, you know, you've got the, the yellow and blue lights and it looks very fancy and, and, and all that. The planet itself is black. It's pure black. Um, and I think, yeah, going in this sort of gothic horror direction and I mean, it's, it's, they filmed all of that, a lot of that in, uh, I think it's Queensland and New Zealand and it shows it's beautiful. It's, it's impressive the, the size of the trees and stuff, but the color palette's much more in line with what we expect from this franchise. Once you start going into the poison Ivy territory, well, they are making a Batman movie. This is... <laughs> yeah. And, and alien's not about being camp. Mm. Okay, so in here it says uh, animation, uh, Angic again, uh, Team in Forest, and then Hallett with a double yeah. T uh, drops his knee, oh, drops to his knees convulsing, and C 
WWZ, World War Z for behavior. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe World War Z, I'm guessing. Oh, yeah, yeah, Because it that wouldn't would make be sense. WWE because that's completely different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that would make sense. That's sort of trying to just convey yeah, that, that kind of feral, unrelenting behavior. Yeah. So uh, this is Hallett, uh, Stefan NPC, and then someone says, don't touch him, uh, which is just like what Ash says in Alien. Mm. Uh, don't touch it. <laughs> Uh, and then, um, I love those callbacks. I know some people go, oh, he's basically remaking the same movie. No, but every time he has a callback like that, he's putting it into a new context. Yeah. Um, and I love the whole idea of, like, uh, we're stuck in this en endless spiral with the xenomorph. Like, all the creators kind of, like, stuck in a cycle of death and rebirth. Yeah, we've talked about that a few times. It just seems to be coming up uh, again and again. So it must be something that's intrinsic to the franchise that... You know, all this has happened before and all this will happen again. Mm. Uh, so it says uh, in panel 30, Halleck convulsing. I also want to bring to light uh, that through here, the um, alien is bursting out of Halleck's back. Uh, and I think they they that was a change that they decided that it was too repetitive. I think Stefan Levolis wrote that in um, his... Uh, his own storyboarding so he's done a storyboard for the back burster and also a storyboard for the mouth burster and then ridley's mm -hmm. like let's go through the mouth because it's yeah. not repeating again um and i think that was a really good idea like ridley has and go oh i want it to be different i don't want to burst out of the chest i want it to burst out the back hold on two backs in a row let's do something different so i, I really appreciate that he's changed that yeah, because the chest burst has been done, no pun, to no pun intended, it's been done to death. Um, <laughs> and you know what to anticipate now. So, um, what? yeah, the backburster scene, even though they did put it in the trailers, which I wish they didn't do, um, you didn't know how it was going to emerge. You're just watching it, oh, oh, what's going to, but he's got ribs and there's a spine, oh, 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 like you just do not know. The specifics, even though you know something's going to erupt from somewhere, yeah. actually seeing it happen, yeah, that was a very good choice. I, I really like that. Um, another thing about these storyboards I'm noticing as we go on, yeah, there's no, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason as to what he's focusing on. So now we're actually getting much more detailed, um, but it seems to be an emphasis on shots he really wants to capture. They're not specifically technical ones. It's just, oh, these are the, the beats I really want to emphasize that that must happen. And like in in the film, they they definitely reduced the amount of lights. There were guns, and they didn't have torches. Whereas in this one, they have torches. You can see the little light beams coming out of the little um, Ridley grounds, which I, I really appreciate that little detail. Well, they do have torches, but yeah, it's they've it's got it's the only laser sights, and that's um, what they use for um for visuals. They don't have. Like no, lights. like when, yeah, when uh, Daniels and Walter are inside the wreckage of the ship. Oh yeah, no, but when they when they're but in for the most part grass. it's filmed during the day, yeah. And then um, when they're um, following, well, it's actually a deleted scene uh, where they're looking down at the the engineers, the the ship, yeah, sort of bay. They've all got torches on there, but for, yeah, for the most part, they don't use those torches. As, the, the filmmakers do not use those torches as a means of lighting mm. the film, which I, don't know, I think that would have been kind of cool um, and <laughs> certainly would have saved a bit of money uh, just in terms <laughs> of yeah, lighting rigs and also you don't have to show as much of the environment. A lot of it's implied. But I'm glad we got what we got, which is a much grander scale. Yeah. So uh, on to page seven now. Um, it says Hallett convulsing combination of Carlos and NPC, and we can see it's coming out of uh, the back again. So I'll show people. So it says shows Hallett there, like reaching for his back, but not being able to reach out. What's happening? And then oh, that's what that is. The alien emerging out and attacking the crew. So it says in panel 32 uh the baby near morph in brackets carlos 
there is no way, like, if you've got something smashing through your spine like that, you're not moving your arms. You, you're, you're done. It's <laughs> yeah, your head your reach. head would be limp too. That, that'll be, <sighs> that's it. Yeah, you, you're dead. Mm. Although I did, not to tangent too much, but uh, there's a subreddit called Nature is Metal, and uh, there was this fish swimming along that had had most of its body bitten off, and it was just the head and the fins. So it's was just the front the part. Sunfish? Because I, those I don't know what a sunfish is, <laughs> but it's yeah, like you've just got like all the all the guts and like the, the remnants, but the, it's mostly just the head and the fin part, and it's just still swimming along. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh dear. I mean, that's metal. I know, like seeing something that is. Oh no, it wasn't a sunfish. No, it was a different. Um, but yeah. Just seeing something that should definitely be dead, but it's still going. We'll link to it. We won't show you the picture. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And, and, and not to, oh God, I just, I keep thinking of gruesome stories. It's just what I do. Um, uh, on, on, also on Reddit, a uh, cop was saying that he, and this is actually something that's in the movie Brightburn. So weird that it's just. I encountered this very specific injury twice. Yeah, but, spoiler alert yeah. for people who haven't watched Brightburn, by the way. Yes, so I won't <laughs> go into too much specific there, but yeah, this this cop in, in real life was saying that there was... Uh, this car had wrapped itself around a pole, and this woman had stumbled out. She was obviously drunk driving, and she was just so plastered that she didn't notice that her jaw was completely dislocated. It was just hanging there. Um, and, oh, and it had been cut so it was sort of like it was oh my lord and yeah he he said of all the things i've ever seen uh on duty yeah i'm not forgetting that one but she was fine she's just like oh what's going on (laughs) but that's i love that in horror movies where someone should definitely not still be walking around but they are oh dear yeah (laughs) on on the whole nature is metal thing i think i've seen one where uh there were these reindeer that had fought and the other one had bled out and its carcass was starting to rot, but the other reindeer had its horns locked into the other one. So it yeah. was just walking around with the dead reindeer attached to its antlers. <laughs> that is way more common than you'd think. Apparently, <laughs> if, if you're a hunter and you go out into these forested areas, you keep finding like two male uh, deer or buck, I should say, or, or reindeer or whatever it is, just locked together like you just find skeletons of two antlered animals stuck together and they obviously just starved, starved and died <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh dear i'm gonna have to put a tw on this post so definitely <laughs> to warn people animal cruelty yeah. but yeah. animals to well i mean other. they're being cruel to themselves it's their <laughs> own problem all right, down on to number 33. So it says, uh, after the Neomorph has, like, falls from his back, placenta, umbilical, etc., screams in the torch. So I like that as well. That there, are, You know, it's not this very clean process of chest burster, you know, it's ready to go, just skitters off. You've actually got, you know, the placenta and this umbilical cord. It's like, it's it's trying to... I think final as well, when it comes out of... Hallett's mouth when it oh yeah it definitely is the, it the, looks the, like the, the sack yeah it looks like the 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 original chest burster when it comes out but then it um, kind of falls and then it almost feels like it's trying to utilize the biology of the host it's it's reproducing in a way that is somewhat mammalian yeah um so it says here light moves out sea monster dark continent for alien movement dark continent is that a movie it sounds like it might be this it rings fast before shot can be fired so that obviously the neomorph is already like not bulletproof but it can move pretty quickly ah monsters dark continent is a 2014 film uh, American soldiers in the Middle East contend with aliens and insurgents during a mission into hostile territory to extract four comrades. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> I didn't know that was an inspiration. Uh, yeah, so it looks like he watches all sorts of things for inspiration. He's very keyed into the zeitgeist, uh, World War Z, and, uh, 
um, and this movie as well. Um, but it's it's for movement, I think. So he's using – that's very interesting that he's thinking about things um, in terms of, what is it, uh, uh, kinesthetics, I think, the, the movement of things. Yeah. Um, so he's not only thinking about visuals in terms of comp- composition, lighting, aesthetics. He's thinking about how things move. And that's quite apparent when you look at how he directs the android characters as well. A lot of that comes from the actors. But he does seem to have an interest in how things move. Mm. In panel 34, it says Loeb reaches out to touch the body of Hallett. And then Oram shouts, don't touch him. So... In the film... Uh, is the Aram's... torch in his mouth or is that just... Yeah, the torch is in his mouth. Oh, um, he's holding... Yeah, uh, maybe because he's holding the gun. Um, I don't know, but Aram is not, shallow, is not even there, I think. he's In the film, he's face down, he's crying about um, his wife having died, Corinne. So it's... It's Daniel's there, and I think it's really good that they don't have this, like, don't touch him scene, because that small part with um, Lope holding the limp hand of Hallett and rubbing on the wedding ring and crying is, is a really touching moment, even though it's quite brief, and people people complain about Covenant not having a scene where the characters actually stop and feel for what's people dying around really? them. Really? Yeah, I people's think... like... Oh, they, they don't do anything. They don't say anything. But like, oh yeah. my god, they do. Especially in the scene, yeah, where where Orum, is, well, Daniels has got Orum on the ground. She's shielding him from it, and the characters. I actually really like the crew of Covenant. I know Prometheus definitely suffers from that issue where people don't act like real people. They don't seem to be emotionally impacted the way real people would be. The Covenant, I think they did take their time to really establish these characters. Um, and they've even given them, uh, like, there's another, there's a prequel book, which, yeah, the characters are identifiable, they're distinct. And they react like real people would in a situation like this. Yeah. What a lot of people get, seem to, yeah, sorry. Sorry, we get Daniels crying on the ship. Yes, oh my god. We get gosh, she, crying after Absolutely. And then we also get... Tennessee? Uh, yeah, Tennessee. We get Lope crying. The only uh, possible um, problem I have with the crew not reacting is Rosie and Anka. But we aren't made aware of their relationship until well, after Rosenthal, the film. Well, Rosenthal, even, she has a, well, it's a, I think it's a leaded scene where she's praying. And that sort of gives her a bit more humanity and a bit more depth. So... Yeah, uh, I, I absolutely don't understand that complaint at all. The other thing, and this happens with every single horror movie ever, is people just, oh, why would you go along with this? Why did you just get out of it? Because you are someone sitting comfortably in a theatre watching a horror movie. Like, you paid tickets to see a horror movie. You know what you're going in for. The characters in the story... <laughs> don't know they're in a horror movie yeah. so their guard isn't up at 11 like if someone told you okay you've just been transported into a horror movie then you're just gonna be like i'm not answering that door i'm locking all the doors and windows oh my god even even though you wouldn't be that paranoid in real life mm. so i think yeah the characters they're in a desperate situation um you know that they're, they're trapped on this planet they can't just get back up you know it's not beam me up scotty um they they cannot get back to their ship um, they've obviously quickly realized this is not ideal for habitation, which, I mean, most planets in the universe don't contain homicidal robots <laughs> and monsters. So I think they were pretty well um, in the right to think, okay, well, this looks like an Earth-like planet. The water's clean and drinkable. The air's breathable. Cool. That's basically all you need to know before colonizing a planet in, you know, normal circumstances. Mm. Clearly, this was not normal circumstances. So they go down, they explore the planet, seems good, and then all hell breaks loose. And then, yes, if they could, they would have left, but they couldn't because I seem to recall their shuttle exploded. (laughs) 
Yeah, and and the thing is as well, uh, the these people have they, they live far into the future. Most mm. of the Earth's wildlife would already be dead. They've been sitting comfortably at the top of the food chain for a very long time. I doubt they'd be prepared for any. any yeah, that seems to be something <laughs> that is fairly canonical at this point. That Earth is. Basically, like we see it in Blade Runner, there's not a lot of nature anymore. So, yeah, maybe they've got synthetic pets, but that's about it. Um, so they are not equipped to deal with nature, even if they did do like a training course before leaving Earth. Mm. Um, and also, yeah, they, so yes, you could go, oh, why don't they just all gang up on David and destroy him? Well, yes, they could because they did outnumber him, but he was their only guide and uh, resource on this planet. So they had, the, again, like if you are in a desperate situation and you're, the only person helping you is kind of dodgy, I mean, you, you accept the help because that's all you got, you know? Mm, that's right. So uh, there, all your complaints about Alien Covenant are wrong. <laughs> We're up to um, Ridley Graham number 35 and it said, I want to highlight that they've spelt his name differently, Ledworth. L E D W O R T H S. So, how's it normally spelled? Oh, lead word. It's lead word. Yeah, mm. yeah. Uh, that's like Melbourne's name changed a number of times. Yeah. Uh, I think one L and two Ls and one L and yeah. Um, yeah, that is interesting that they kind of know the the name or the the sound, the general mouth feel of the name that they want to go for, but it, the the spelling here does. Uh, shift of it. It's like Lope. Is it Lope and they're just calling him Lope for short? I I was never clear on that yeah, one. Yeah, I think it's just... Uh, I have no idea. Maybe it's... Because there's an accent. His full name is Lope, definitely. Yeah. That is that is a name. Lope is not a name, but they just call him Lope for short, I think. But then it's still... That's a weird one because the name is pronounced with two syllables. But then if you remove the second syllable... You're saying it phonetically how it was spelled, so it's not a nickname. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, like, yeah, it's just it's just strange how they decided to go with that spelling. Like the same the same thing happened in Prometheus, right? We had Yannick and Janik, <laughs> and people kept on saying it differently. Yeah, I well, I was never confused about it because I went to school with a boy named Yannick, and it was Y A N E K. Uh, and that's how it that's how it's pronounced. You never say Janik. Um but I guess if you haven't encountered the name before then it yeah, it looks like that. Um and then it can also be spelled Y A W N I C K. The other one that people get wrong is Nguyen. That one drives because I grew up with a lot of Vietnamese kids in my class, so N G U Y E N, yeah, clearly it's Nguyen. And people are like Nguyen? <laughs> Good try. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so, uh, in panel 35, they didn't bother drawing it out, but uh, Ledworth's Neomorph attacks, followed by a smaller Neo Hallet, so the mouth burster. And then in panel 36, you can see uh, the Neomorph attacking the crew, and they're in the forest, not in the grass field. And it says, See Mountains of the Moon for Attack, Night, and Monsters. So, here's another movie Mountains of the Moon. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, it is a 1990 film. Uh, explorers determined to find the source of the Nile in Central Africa. Hmm. Again, kind of looks a little like the lake in Covenant. Interesting. I love that. I love seeing where artists take inspiration from. And some people, clearly not artists themselves, feel like, oh, well, everything's derivative. No, it's about remixing and rebuilding and taking elements from totally separate sources that's and bringing Alien them together. Was, because, like, and they that's... took inspiration from 2001 A Space Odyssey. They took inspiration mm. from Star Wars. They took inspiration from everything. And even Dan O'Bannon, when he wrote the scripts... Uh, it is inspired by his, you know, Dark Star script, so... Yeah, I think that there's very, very few examples of modernism in film. And by, what the, by that I mean, it, 
breaking it down to the simplest terms, modernism is art that tries to radically move away from everything that had been previously established. And postmodernism calls back upon what has already existed and remixes it, reshapes it, gives it new context and form. Yeah. So um, it's, film, I would say, is inherently, it, it is a, film has a language, film has tropes, uh, stories have tropes and structure. You cannot deviate from these things too far, well, especially if you're making a conventional Hollywood film. You have parameters. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult. I, well, I would say maybe Kubrick and maybe Alfred Hitchcock mm. and early innovators like that. You could say their films are, are very close to what we might consider modernism. They're the ones who invented that language. They're the ones who put forth these ideas from which everyone else is drawing inspiration. Mm. Um, and it's funny you should the, say that because Ridley mm. obviously homages Hitchcock in the shower scene and yeah. obviously you know, taking cues from um, Kubrick with a lot of his films in this as well. So. Yeah, so I'm. I feel like maybe that first generation of filmmakers. Although I mean, Kubrick was a contemporary of Ridley Scott. Or sort of, there's a bit of overlap there. Um, yeah, that first generation is probably our closest example of modernism because they were coming up with this language for the first time. Um, whereas I, yeah, you can definitely say that all these alien films are postmodern, uh, especially when anything that's a part of a franchise is postmodern. Um, and it's kind of, it, of all films, I love watching the evolution and the, the lineage of Alien because you can see these ideas being revitalized, re, reinvented, reshaped. Uh, and, and to see Ridley himself do that mm. with his own concepts, uh, it, it's fascinating. And that's why I'm so excited for the possibility of a third film, play, uh, of a third prequel film because I know it's going to continue to grow and innovate. Whereas something like Star Wars, especially George Lucas's Star Wars films, it was fairly consistent. It's it's pretty much the same thing. Even the prequels, even though the technology changed, mm. it's still Star Wars films. Still, it's still kind of recognisable. Yeah. Um, okay, so then panel 37. This is meeting with David and go to City. And then it goes straight from 37 to 38, which is the in, in, internal of the Pantheon. Uh, David's, what does it say? Lair? I, I was going to assume it has to be Lair, but it looks like it starts with a H. I don't know. Yeah. And then it says C eggs in brackets. And then Guy well, Look at that. Power. Look how... Yeah accurate the layout of that room is to what it is in the final version yeah. he knows it, he must have hyperfantasia he knows exactly how it needs to look <laughs> um and if you watch uh any behind the scenes stuff but uh well, furious gods the the documentary is a good example of ridley getting all up in every individual department saying okay so like the door has to be here and it's going to be like this wide and you're going to have pillars and he knows exactly what is needed for the scene nothing more nothing less yeah. he knows exactly where he's pointing the camera i mean he tends to build full sets mm. but and you notice this especially with alien covenant where there's a smaller budget he's like yep yeah, no problem. I know exactly where I want to put the camera, so we'll only build what we need. Mm. Uh, and that's really cool. So, I know I'm praising really Scott too much, but I love the fact that <laughs> give him a huge budget, he'll build you know 360 degree sets and and work with that and work with the improvisational possibilities that presents. Mm. He doesn't have enough of a budget. Okay, well we just need this much, and that's all we need to build. That's all we, mm. and then we can repurpose that. You know, move these columns over here, make it a totally new scene. I wish you see they, Alien. They did the full 360 of the um, the Dreadnought. They built the entire thing uh, to be able yes. to um, was that the crossing. Was the uh, the well a lot of the Dreadnought was that repurposed from Prometheus? I wonder if those sets were still. So they still that. had the the molds for that. But a lot of it had to be um, 
3D printed and then mm. retextured and then put together. But they, they had all of the models from the original, so it was a lot easier to put it together again. Right, I think I do remember something about that. And it's such a shame that movie sets don't get preserved the way other bits of movie memorabilia do. Like, they were even able to track down the uh, the, the alien queen on, on Resurrection. Like, a collector still had her just sitting in a shed. Um, and my teacher was actually involved, uh, from Whopper, my, my prop teacher, it was actually involved in that and, and building on top of that, like making the belly and, and all of that. Mm. Um, so that's amazing to me that you, you still have, you know, gigantic puppets, but how often do we preserve sets? Almost never. And it's a real shame. I know so many friends of mine who go, Oh, well, I'd pay good money to like go to basically like a theme park you, and you just wander through. Oh, yeah, this is a set from Prometheus, and you can just wander and maybe sit in the engineer chair. Holy shit. Uh, and this was a, you know, this is from like, I don't know, The Martian or, or whatever. Yeah. Why do they not do that? There, there was going to be a Fox World park um, built mm. in Malaysia, but I think they were just banking on the name it was just going to be like a, a fun park with a lot of like yeah. branding on it because i know they did a matrix exhibit at warner brothers movie world and for the sets it was all recreated it, it wasn't the original like you could walk through the from in the in the sequels that the white tunnel with all the the doors leading down like they're just sort of mm. replicating it but yeah. they obviously destroyed the original set mm. It's really cool, though. Mm. So in here it says uh, Giga Drawing or... I can't... Giga. Giga, sorry. Giga Drawing Yeah, so it's or... a Giga counter and it's HR Giga, yeah. Ah, I keep, I keep stuffing that up. I am so sorry, yeah. Giga fans <laughs> out there. Um, what does that say? Is it Cup with a K? Uh, drawing or... I see you. I see you P. <laughs> or is it K U P? Doesn't neither makes any sense. No. Well, in the next panel, number thirty-nine, this is Aram examines an egg, uh, touches it, and then it says John Hurt moment, face hugger attack. So it's definitely a callback to yeah. the original Alien, which is that's fine and because again, that was his movie. You know what? This is actually, so he actually touches it which is obviously ridiculous. Don't do that. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I think the way they covered it in the film was sensible. So, you know, obviously John Hurt gets right up in it and he's touching it and no one seems to criticise it, but they will criticise the scene in Alien Covenant. Oram has a gun and he's, like, slowly approaching... Because if he says no, what's the android going to do? Like, if you're like, ah, no, nah, fuck this, I'm leaving... The android is faster, stronger, smarter than you. What are you going to do? So, yeah, he's he's cautiously looking. I'm like, hey, what's this about? So I defend <laughs> Oram. I think he's perfectly justified in what he's doing. I would be, I've been doing the same thing in the same situation. Um, you know, I don't even know what's in this. So I'm like, face like I can't get me if I put my <laughs> hands up. You know, it's, yeah. there's no preparation. You don't know what's in there. That's it. In the second part, it says face hugger, giga, or cup. There's a cup or cut as Oram goes down. So maybe it was giga drawing or cut or cup previously? Or maybe it's code. Maybe it, I think it's probably abbreviation. Yeah. All right, we'll find out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> on to page nine, and I'll just scroll up so and show people what we're up to. And we're already part of the escape. So it says here, see clips from Beck from Martian as he ah. leaps in space for Tennessee movements. So this is when Tennessee is in space still and they're doing repairs to the sails, I believe. So mm. this is before the script changed. Uh, Panel number 43, Ridley Graham, it says, Crew escapes to transporter pursued by the alien. 
in brackets Aram, so this is Aram's son, and sea monster, dark continent, reference for movement, and in brackets of grace. So that's interesting. Mm. And number 44 doesn't even have an explanation, but we can obviously see it's the lifter and the crew are on it and they're fighting the alien. And number 45, it says the transporter takes off with the alien on it and Griff fights it off. So this is when uh, Daniels is called Griffin. Mm. Um, I, I refer to Daniels as a name. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, there's also another reference to uh, the monster of Dark Continent for movement and grace. So, <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, and then, so I, I just want to stop for a moment there. Like when they're referring mm. to Daniels as the Griffin, I believe that there was this one part, one of the the uh, art pieces which inspired the team wandering through the forest. Mm. Uh, there was a chariot being pulled by a griffin and then all of these ah. like people following it so it's really interesting um, i'll have to link it to that on the post mm. but maybe that was the naming convention for for daniels before it was changed oh um and i had to look it up because it didn't look right so uh beck is uh, sebastian stan's character from the martian it's actually spelled b-e-c-k so you don't even know how to spell your own character's name right ridley <laughs> It's not his job. <laughs> He's just the director. Yeah, I mean, that that actually might be why some of these characters' names aren't spelled correctly as well. Because, I mean, I'll find out eventually when I read the scripts for Alien Covenant by Minute. But uh, yeah, I I think the names we noticed that were spelled wrong here are spelled correctly, quote unquote, correctly in in the, the original scripts. Mm, yeah, that's right. So this is uh, the last page, I believe. Yep. So I'll just show people uh, what we're up to. Now this is page 10, Ridley Graham number 46, and we see the very classic view of the alien um, in the doorway. And we've seen this in you know Alien Isolation. and Blow it out of the airlock. Yeah. So it says, Lope's alien is not on the ship, uh, pursued by Griffin. And then number 47, final arena in the cargo chamber where the alien is ejected into space. And then number 48, finally, in brackets, David's walk through the sleeping chamber and colonists. He is ejected in... Yeah. Oh, so... I think we dropped out there. Oh, did, did we? Yeah, so the, the alien gets ejected. Yeah, because I was trying to read it. I was saying, uh, yeah... <laughs> Uh, I, was, I was reading what it said, yeah. Mm. But then David's walk through the sleeping chamber and the colonists, and then that's the end. Right. So yes, yeah, so we obviously had a very specific idea. Uh, I don't want to. No, it's not really a spoiler for uh, for I Am Mother, but there's there's definitely some things in common with Alien Covenant. Yeah, and um... it's basically what if Walter was more robotic and was the main character. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and if Walter was the bad guy. Yes, um, so I, I would very much like to do a review on that soon. I might get around to that. Uh, it's just, I've got two podcasts on the go right now. I've got so much <laughs> editing to do. But we are so I, busy. I, I've been trying to rope you in to finish off the Alien Scripts analysis, and we didn't end up doing that, so I ended up having to do it on my own. No, sorry. It's okay. Um, I managed to get you for this, which is really cool. Yes, I, I supernova is this weekend, but I finished my costumes well in advance. I'm ready to go. Um, and so, if anyone you, wants uh, to stalk Connor in person, you can head to Supernova in Perth. Yes. <laughs> and um, oh, there is an I Am Mother. The director's going to be there. There's going to be a panel about that, so I'm very excited. <gasps> oh my god! You're going to tell yeah, me about I hope he brings a costume. <laughs> oh, and um, awesome. yeah, so I, I've yeah, all my commissions are sort of at a, at a good point now that mostly done and and so yes I, I can sort of uh mostly focus on podcasts and i might yeah do an i am mother uh, video essay because there's a lot to say mm, yeah definitely um i wouldn't mind doing a small uh discussion on it just exclusive for uh you tiny patreons if you want to 
talk yeah, about Yeah, I, I, I would love to do this one. I can link to your video essay. <laughs> yeah. Woo. I'm going to open a doc right now so I remember that I'm doing this. I'm c- Look, it's happening. Yep, yeah, I am mother. Let's say spell that video essay. <laughs> Boom. Done. <laughs> Save. I have to do it. I have to do it now. It's it on is, the list. It's on the list, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that's really exciting. We did this review of the script. Um, it's available through me. Just contact me and I will flick you one. And you just have to make sure that you source Yutani um mm. as your reference just yeah don't, don't be don't be stealing <laughs> yeah like it, you know i i don't own this script but i don't know who sent it to me and i don't know yes. whether it was right to share it <laughs> so if you if you want to if you want to take on that that um that responsibility. Torch and responsibility yeah. as well then you're gonna have to to interact with me and talk about it um mm-hmm. Or, or be cheeky and get screenshots of our talk today <laughs> with me and Connor. I, um, yeah, I honestly, when I look at the Ridley Grams or any sort of uh, storyboards and stuff, I just tend to flick through it and just go, eh, yeah, 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 I got it. Yeah, it's like a movie. But when we took our time and actually went through it uh, panel by panel, I realized, oh, there, there were, there's, there's a lot to be gained from, from analyzing these. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, just having a bit of research for all of the things and i'm like there's a lot of stuff that i didn't even research before this this was like first experience i saved you know we both broke our cherry on this script uh this really graham scripts immediately together um mm. it, no, neither of us have had time to really you know look over it in great detail so i have mostly stopped taking notes when i'm on a podcast with other people because i know that I already talk too much. I don't need additional uh, conversation points. <laughs> <laughs> but I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a good co-host. You just you need someone to fill some space. Here I am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that, that's about does it for our, um, uh, our yes. live stream today. So, yeah, uh, if you yeah, want so... to catch up with Connor and what he does, yeah. just head over to... I'll let you take over. Yes. Right, so uh, if you want more of me, God knows why, but okay. Um, there's uh, Prometheus by a Minute. Uh, you can get that wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Facebook page. And I have an Instagram, so if you're interested in my adventures at Supernova this weekend, that will be Connor Colson Prime. And that that's just my, my Instagram account. So there's all sorts of stuff on there. Was there anything else? Oh, and TraviandDesigns.com. That's where... That's another place where you can get the podcast and all my other creative projects. Uh, I'll be doing a photo shoot as Connor from Detroit Become Human very soon. Ooh, can't wait to see that. <laughs> yes. That'd be awesome. My name is Connor. I'm the android sent by Cyberlife. <laughs> I mean, it's already my... I, I have been to parties... Uh, I have been to a party dressed as Connor. And it's so funny where I just went, Oh, hi, I'm Connor. Oh, yeah, what are you dressed as? Connor. No, 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 what are you dressed as? No, <laughs> I am Connor, but I'm also dressed as Connor. Never mind. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> it's all right. People will get it soon enough, especially this weekend at Supernova when it'll be oh, obvious yeah. that everyone's in cosplay. Oh, yes. And I've got... Uh, can I hold that up? Yeah. To the... I'll be selling these very soon. I've got some uh, little badges of the Detroit uh, triangles that the oh, androids they wear. Uh, so there's a magnet on the back, and I'm realizing I may, for future ones, probably put two so they don't uh, probably put two in there so they don't rotate around so much because one yeah. it can just spin around. Yeah. Um, but it holds quite well, and I think the magnets that that reduces the cost for the customers as well because brooch backings are a bit more expensive, mm. um, and then you can just get your own magnet or whatever you want to do. But the the badge is, you know. Perfectly customizable for whatever you need it to be. Awesome stuff. Mm. Oh, okay. And of course, everyone can reach me at the following address in, oh, sorry, this way, in the corner, yutani.studio. We're on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Tumblr. We are on Instagram. We're also on Reddit. So if you come to the LV223 Reddit, you can share and post anything that's alien, sci fi related. Um, come chat to us in the chat room uh, or hop onto discord yeah we are all over oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> everywhere 
everywhere you want to be. Mm. Okay, cool. Thanks for joining in, guys. Thank you, Connor, for joining me no today. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Bye. Bye. Remember to like, share, or support Studio Yutani on Patreon, and subscribe to yutani.studio to stay up to date. Transmission complete. This is Mother 9000, signing off. <laughs>